FemNorth Nets, Interviews with Northern Women Leaders. This is a recording of a conversation with Myrnie Kelly of Hope Haven in Labrador West, conducted in June 2013 with Petrina Bales and Jane Stinson. In this interview, Myrnie discusses her experiences as a Northern leader. The work that I do here, hmm. it's pretty encompassing. Um, number one is the clients. Uh, we uh, work with victims of uh, family violence, women and children, and um, we provide six weeks stay. Mm -hmm. And lately, uh, that has involved a lot of extensions because of the housing situation here. Um, I'm also involved with uh, PANEL, the Transition House Association of Newfoundland and Labrador, and um, I serve on the executive there as well. Um, I'm also on the uh, uh, Community Advisory Board for Homelessness. Uh, I co-chair with Noreen Excellent. on that committee. Uh, and I think you're probably aware that right now we're into uh, up to our necks in uh, uh, starting an affordable housing unit and uh, that's uh, 10 apartments and that will service uh, single parents, male and female. Okay. How did you come to be in this position? Oh, there's a long history behind that. Um, I started out as a volunteer when the original uh, family crisis shelter opened, Wow. which was 28 years ago. Um, I volunteered for I think four years before it became a position and then I worked for 11 years as a crisis intervention worker. Um, from there, I went to, took the position of admin assistant. And only two years ago, I got the position of executive director. Wow. So it's been a long ride. Right. <laughs> what sort of things influenced you, uh, your decision to take this work? Like when you switched from each, you went to each role, I'm guessing, in the organization. It was just an evolution, really. Um, I guess uh, from time to time when the uh, administrator at that time uh, was on leave or uh, out of town for whatever reason, I stepped into that role a number of times. And um, a few times there were extended leaves and gaps in the, in the position here, which I filled not only as admin assistant, but took on the role as administrator from time to time. And uh, it, it just seemed natural right. that, you know, I, I'd try to move on. And um, it's it's a challenge. It's quite different than what I was used to. Right. But, um, yeah, it's all, it's all new. What's your job <laughs> title here now? Executive director. Executive right director, now. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you describe your leadership style? Ah, teamwork would have to be. <laughs> I uh, I rely heavily on the staff here. We have a an amazing staff, and uh, very reliable. We work well together, and most of our staff here too have been here for a long time. Right. You know, from ten years to twenty six years. So I've worked side by side with them for so relationships forever. So the relationships are good. Thank God, and um, um, work well on, on committees as well. And I'm more of a backgrounder, I think. I'm not uh, not the face in the you know in front usually. I like to work in the background. And I like to do the the legwork. Mm -hmm. How do you go about engaging women, encouraging their involvement? Uh, oh. We have so many discussions around every issue that's happening in this town, and from from the internal shelter piece, um, I go in. I, I talk to the clients directly, almost on a daily basis, um, and it's a very personal involvement. It's a very passionate involvement. So it's it's not hard to engage women just by just by talking and just by. Allowing everyone to express their own views and and um, and respect. Uh, 
it's very like I am hands on like when it comes to to clients and staff and uh, the girls have no problem asking me for direction or calling me at home for direction and 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 usually it's they've already got the answers right so it's around uh, where we were 20 years ago versus today and we see so many gaps in our service that that were there existed then exist now right you know and um like um we have a wonderful shelter now it's it's state of the art pretty much and that was one of our 20 year battles just trying to achieve that and uh, since we've gotten that we've also had 24 7 staff um, we've uh, started our union about six years ago, I believe. So yeah. that's a new thing for your that's, that's very new. Wow. Yeah. yeah, this is only our third contract now coming up. So who took that on? As who, How did that become, how did your organization become unionized? Uh, was it the staff? It was the staff. Staff initiated that because of uh, uh, job security mainly. Um, because at the time there was there was no security, you got called. It was willy nilly, right. <laughs> if you will, and um, so the need was recognized that we needed seniority clauses. We needed different things put in place, and uh, so staff just um, through again trial and error right. explored some different unions and some different options, and it took three years actually to become unionized wow. after a couple of failures but um, yeah and things are are going well we're we're on par now with all other shelters when it comes to benefits and salaries so mm, that was a positive very positive I remember yeah. also too when the, when you first started when the shelter when that talk started to come to the community and I know I remember from just through the news and all that that there was conflict in the community about that but you, th it was resolved because the shelter went in the same place that it was set out to do. Can you talk a little bit about how the shelter, and how you and your role, and that, how we, how you made it okay for the community? Um, well, we were in the community for a long time before we <laughs> we became obvious, and uh, we had uh, at one point we had a, an apartment building on Avalon Drive. And we were very inconspicuous. No one knew we were there. They didn't know the comings and goings were actually shelter people. And then we uh, moved into the embassy building. It's okay to say all this now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for, oh my gosh, eight years or more, we were in the embassy. We were um, cohabitating, you could say, with all the other residents in, in the building, doing our laundry together. And um, and trying not to identify the clients at the same time, so the workers were thought to be cleaning ladies at the embassy for a long time. Wow! <laughs> and uh, then, of course, we had to, um, uh, like I said, try for twenty years to get the new shelter. At that time, uh, it wasn't accepted the NIMBY mm -hmm. thing on the go here, and um, presentations were given. Public presentations were given. Uh, the town was on board and addressed it at their council meetings, Excellent. things like this. Um, very, we became very public and, and very reassuring all of a sudden. And we were all out, I guess, into the community and saying, you know, like, we've never had an incident. We've been here for 20 years. Have you, you have heard been. of anyone having an issue with the shelter? We've been here. We've been in your backyard. And uh, now we're going to put a nice building in your yard. <laughs> That's going to fit in, and you know, just a lot of reassurance and a lot of, again, leg work and. And congratulations on your beautiful building, because you would never even know unless because it looks just like every other house in the community. Mm-hmm. Which is. Kind of are there factors that you feel are specific to your community that contribute to women's participation? Or lack of participation, maybe. Um. I would have to think that now, uh, in the present time, that a lot of women now are working full-time jobs, raising families, um, 
and the kids are involved in whatever activities are available in Lab City. So time is, you know, like time is really difficult to engage women in, in community work or committees or volunteerism. Right. I think that's probably the biggest challenge now is that women just don't have spare time anymore to do, you know, the, the things that need to get done. Right. So it's a challenge then to form viable committees and, and volunteerism. Do you run any programs um, or events maybe through your shelter or I guess partner in partnership with the Women's Centre, I guess a lot of that? Uh, one of our own actually is a um, cooking program oh. that we're quite proud of. I guess. <laughs> we just started that last year and uh, the uh, staff here um, put together their own cookbook and it's like meals on a budget. So they all brought in their own recipes and things like that and we tried to put it out into the community because we had heard that uh, there was a need for it there's a lot of young people that you know need the um, training if you will you know in, in cooking or just some some hands-on experience in the kitchen <laughs> and uh, so we offered it to the community and we did get some response but not what we hoped for right. so we decided that it would be better uh, served as an in-house program Fantastic. And we do, uh, we do find that our clients really enjoy that. I bet. And uh, they get their own cookbook and their own Hope Haven apron. And <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and all the, it's another piece of ownership that the girls have, the right. staff has. And uh, they're, they're quite proud that that's their own. And a lot of other things that we do partner with the, uh, the Women's Centre, of course, uh, Take Back the Night, right. um, uh, we just did uh, One Million Rising, oh, yeah. and um, and I did a presentation for Hope Haven at that event. Um, mm, well, we're always busy, let's, right. you yes. know, like there's there's different activities throughout the year that come up and, and we just, we partner. The International Women's Day is another event that we partner with. The uh, Purple Ribbon Campaign. Right. Uh, we did, uh, we tried, or I should say I tried, to get the White Ribbon Campaign started in schools. And they were responsive and receptive and agreed to try to get uh, male participation. We provided the materials, right. Hope Haven did, and uh, the did up the presentations and gave them all the information they needed but we encouraged them to take ownership of the program and to continue year after year right so we're hoping fingers crossed we put the presentations and the materials in the high school and the college Excellent. so we're hoping now that'll take life of its own right. from here on in so a big part of your job is helping to create leaders within so you, like you talked about the women that do the cooking. I mean, that's creating some leadership for women in, the, in mm -hmm. your shelter, but also getting out into the community. And it's cool that you're talking about the White Ribbon Campaign because oftentimes it's uh, it's not women's work that's considered. So it's it's great the way you're pushing it to the schools to try to get the mm -hmm. young men involved because sometimes it has to start from women. Yes. Right. Somebody has to start, but you, you need to engage the whole community. It can't be... It can't be a, a responsibility of a couple of organizations. We're trying to encourage other people to take on their own roles. Right. Mm -hmm. Since you've been in this shelter, since you're very vocal and, and the community knows there's a women's shelter there and people, I guess, are knowing who you are as a worker here, um, are you finding more support from the community? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I guess only just uh, recently uh, we've had an opportunity to work, and I say an opportunity, a blessed opportunity to work with the Ministerial Association. And uh, they've been so supportive now in times of housing crisis and um, and in, uh, in providing service that Hope Haven is not mandated to provide and that other community agencies don't have the resources to provide. And we've found that they're stepping up. Excellent. And uh, that's very encouraging. And we work very well with the, the mental health group here next door. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm hearing good things, good feedback around our service. 
Excellent. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. What led you to becoming a leader? Did you have mentors? And are there factors that spurred you on? Mm. So what led you to becoming a leader? I think you were a born leader. <laughs> mm. No, I don't think. Like I said, I'm more of a background player normally. <laughs> and maybe you do lead without even realizing it sometimes, you know, like it's it just... Uh, it just becomes an evolution. It's one step at a time, and, and you end up where you are by the grace of God somewhere or something. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, I guess, just uh, the uh, need to see things done and the um, realizing, I guess, that you have the experience, that you have, you know, you have to be the change that you want to see, I guess. And um, you, you can't always sit behind a desk and watch everyone else do things and sit back and, and disagree or, uh, you know, think that you could do better without doing better. You know, like, put your money where your mouth is, act, nice. attitude, and if you're going to talk about it, do it. Mm -hmm. Nice. Any mentors? Anyone that you looked up to along the way? Mm. There were there were so many. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's it's really valuable, and I wish we had the resources to have every town leader be able to go outside and network with the people and and the um, the leaders in other communities, and they're out there gal in galore. Yeah. You know, and I think probably that was uh, one of my biggest forces was getting outside and doing training and, and hearing other people voice their concerns and, and realizing that you do have an opinion and realizing you have a mind of your own and, and having that empowered. Right. And I think that's, it, it wasn't an individual mentorship. It was like a network of them. Awesome. So... Do you have suggestions for young women who are interested in becoming involved, taking on leadership roles in their community? Oh, I so want the young people yeah. <laughs> to move up, and, and I really do encourage. Um, I have a 15-year-old granddaughter, and um, uh, every opportunity I get, I'm, I'm bringing her little pamphlets of little information, and, and you know, trying to instill in her such independence and, and pride and fellowship, I guess, you know, and respect for other people. Right. And um, even, uh, even in small ways, I think that's where you start. You start with a small group, like my granddaughter and her friends. And they come to me with, you know, like if there's bullying going on or there's there's issues of... Uh, dating violence and things like that. I'm the go-to person for for a few teenagers, and and it gets out, you know. Like, and if each of our staff had three people that they advised or or led in some way, then it's it's getting out there. And apart from that, like I said, I'm trying to put things in information and whatever I can into the schools, the high school especially, and. Uh, Encouraging our young staff, right. you know, to to be responsible and, and step up to the plate when needed, and and get whatever learning and education they can, and and really explore the issues. And, and I guess that's what it's about, all mm -hmm. about creating awareness around the issues that women face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you like to do next as a leader to inspire or engage women? I need to say, like, with the community the way it is right now, I would like to see some kind of emergency housing other than shelters. Because it's, uh, what we're finding now is, uh, and I'm, by saying retirement, it would be semi-retirement. Because I'm seeing a huge need for seniors' issues to be addressed here. And I'm, I'm in that time of life. 
Mm. That uh, I would really like to bite into that a little more. Uh, just yesterday, I had a lady come to our door. Uh, her husband was never in the mines, and uh, so she doesn't have a pension. She's living on Canada Pension in Lab West at this time. Oh my goodness! Luckily, she's got a trailer that's you know probably I don't know forty years old at least, and she's maintaining that on her own uh, with a woman. She uh, also told me about a couple of more friends of hers, you know, that are in in apartments, and their rent has gone from three hundred and fifty uh, to eleven hundred in five years. Oh my goodness. And uh, they're on fixed incomes. No longer can afford to live here. And those are the people that built this town. Of course. You know, and I, I'm really, I get really upset over those things when I see them now because I said, we built the town, we own this place. <laughs> there are I want ownership. Of course. <laughs> mm. And, um, but I think they're, they're getting lost in the shuffle here. And I want to bring it back to where it should be, you know, like respect the ones who built the community. Right. And as you know, as much as we'd like to see the young people move in and take ownership, they're not there yet. And um, so deal with the people that we have and the immediate need and the immediate re need right now is affordable housing. And and seniors is one thing. There are I don't know how many calls we get that we can't provide a service for because we don't have the mandate right. only for our abused women. Of course. And that's that's what we do. But there's not one emergency room in this town for somebody who would find themselves on the street tomorrow. What we do have is overcrowding. Right. And, you know, I'm very aware of uh, young women with, with children living in with their parents. Right family breakdowns because of that, because we all know how difficult it is for two families to, you know, cohabitate. Right. <laughs> and um, especially adult children with children, you know, that's, right. it's very stressful. Uh, we have young people that are, one will get an apartment, they're the tenant, and then they take in probably three more. And I guess they have to do that to they avoid do the They do that, but then when the uh, landlord finds out, they're all evicted. Or the locks are put on the door. We're hearing those stories all the time, right? It's and, yeah, it's, it's, it's very sad. And uh, we had a discussion just this morning around uh, the same thing. We don't see it. Right. We go in our homes and we close our doors and we don't see that those people are are struggling so so much and uh, if you have two thousand dollars a month income how can you survive on twelve uh, with twelve hundred dollars rent right. how do you do that I don't know and we get asked that question on a daily basis of here course. you know like what do you want me to do I know you got room or uh, can't you take me in can't you make an exception no we can't but we'll do what we can to sort of band-aid right. on it for now, you know. And thus, you know, like the other organizations that we refer to, we're, we're passing things back and forth sometimes. And you can have somebody in the system for years that get lost in that right. shuffle, you know. And I really struggle with that. Sometimes you just... Put up your hands and say, where's the progress? Right. You know, if this person I saw five years ago is still out there knocking on the door with nowhere to live, mental health issues, addiction issues, right. all those things, and we're not there. We're so not there. And it's a shame because, to me, uh, and people don't like to hear this, but I'll say it anyway, uh, we put out more tax money than we pretty much support the province in a lot of ways. You know, like Labrador is the resourceful yes. section of the province. Absolutely. And uh, and we don't we have the least services. We don't have second stage housing. We don't have emergency housing. 
We have a dentist who's fly in and fly out. We can't retain doctors. They're in and out like I don't know what. Um, we're losing a lot of our resources for the kids. Like there's there's no youth programs anymore. There's no youth center. Um, all the things that we got used to and got accustomed to having for our children and our young adults are it's not here anymore. Wow. You don't have to go very far, drive through a town and see the infrastructure, you know, like we even got potholes. I joke about this. We got potholes in our mall now. We get to all sections. We just talked about on the drive here, talking about how, how can this community be so powerful in this province and the people in this community are the ones that are suffering the most. Yeah. With, with I mean, no service lack of services, lack of housing. We've got a group of women who are leading the way and uh, I guess it's hard to be a leader and lead the way when you're 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 constantly hitting walls. Always hitting walls, mm -hmm. and losing. Right. You know, like no matter how, one step forward and two back is is so true here in Lab City at this time. Anyway, right? Uh, it's great that our kids can stay home and and work here now in the mines and and have a future, but it's it's at a big cost. I'll tell you another uh, story. We had a pancake breakfast here for the. Um, housing coalition and uh, two senior women came up and they said uh, um, their husbands had gotten sick they they had very similar stories uh, their husbands had gotten sick a number of years ago like 10 years ago let's say and uh, they sold their houses then at like sixty thousand dollars that's that was going price at that time and now it's like 360 um, but they uh, moved into the uh, embassy building mm -hmm. because they couldn't maintain their houses anymore and they couldn't do the shoveling and lawn maintenance and, and things like that. So they thought it made sense, you know, to move into an apartment building. And uh, since then, the husband's passed on. Those two ladies are now in the embassy paying $1,200 a month right. with, uh, with nowhere to go, literally nowhere to go. And they're just making ends meet by doing quilting or seamstress work or baking, different things like that, you know, just to subsidize a rent, you know. And they are not going to come out and say what the issues are or say they're having issues because they're afraid they'll lose what they already have. So they suffer through. And it's wrong. It's just plain wrong. It really is. Mm. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's another piece, and and we have to get people to speak out. You know, complacency is not going to work here. No. Mm. Yeah. That's all the questions I have. Jane, do you have any? Yeah, just maybe a couple. <laughs> just on the last one, um, that is partly sort of leadership. And maybe you can look at Patrina when you answer it. But um, yeah, how do you think you, how do you, like, what, what role can you play in helping encouraging other women to speak out? How do you encourage other women to speak out? Hmm. I think by providing a venue and actually um, one, of the, one of the things, I guess, another partnership with the Women's Centre is... Um, Letting women know that there is a place to go. There is a, a place that you can safely talk about right. your concerns. And if the data, I think, were kept here and, and we were to be able to uh, give the women a safe place to go and, and document their stories, uh, to me that would be a starting point, right. a jump off point. Creating a space for women to actually have a voice, mm -hmm. where they feel and making them realize that I know there are senior cl seniors clubs, but not everybody attends the seniors right. clubs. So that's a small, uh, small piece of it. But I guess my biggest concern is that the word is not out to the people that need the supports, right. and I think that we need to form some kind of uh, an awareness program where it's safe enough for the women to come out and say, you're not at risk of, you're not going to be identified. We're not going to say that you're complaining about the embassy or right. Deneen or wherever. 
that you can come and you can, we can document your story and we can bring it forward. And I think that again is another partnership between all organizations. And I, I really want to, to see interagency activity right. around it. Mm -hmm. And has that shifted in the last little while? Because I know you're a CAP group, I guess. Our CAP group still, uh, still meet. And um, uh, there are so many, I guess, so many issues out there now that, right. uh, you know, you only can bite into one or two, I guess, at a time, right. you know. So it, you don't want to water it down either. Right. So, mm -hmm. And as I said, you know, that's that's another focus for another day. It's still a homeless issue, so I think some of it might be addressed now with the uh, with the affordable housing unit, with the new apartments going up. It might alleviate some of the pressure. Uh, I don't see um, a big mm, influx of, of open apartments and affordable. Right. You know, like that's I don't see that happening anytime soon and uh, but what I would like to see is that like seniors and homeless actually have um, subsidies rent some control. options right. rent control there's got to be something and I think we're we're starting to move towards it and uh, and again interagency uh, supports are are the big thing are key to it. Mm -hmm. Just one final question. Um, sort of back to you becoming a leader, right? You said it was partly step by step, and it was also the networking and the learning by networking. So I wondered, just because we're also looking at a northern communities, um, what what helped with the networking? Was it largely in town? Was it out of town? You know, how did it was that largely happen? out of town? How did that networking happen? Especially getting out of town. Mm -hmm. Resources um, to do it. Well, again, it was uh, through opportunities through other groups like Panel, uh, who uh, from time to time acquired funding for trainings in in Goose Bay or in St. John's or uh, conferences. I was also uh, president of the union, which provided me with the opportunity to to travel somewhat. And there were times that where the um, executive director at that time uh, couldn't represent the organization, and I'd be next in line for those opportunities for conferences or trainings. And I did take advantage of every opportunity I got for training or networking locally as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm really encouraging the staff here to do the same. Although, you know, you're not always uh, compensated for it, as we all know. You know, it's, uh, um, it's, it's a choice to learn. So, and I did. I took every advantage of every opportunity I could.